O for my power, because that's just kind of standard power. And if I go through and I calculate, all that you need to go through and take a look at really is look at your uh, required sample size. So here, in order to achieve adequate power, we would need 65 people. Now your actual achieved power is a little bit higher than 0.80 because you actually don't need quite 65, a little bit below, but like we need whole people to participate in our samples. And so this is my actual power that I get. Pretty easy to run through this stuff. Questions? All right, if we want to do an independent sample t-test, let's say uh, investigators are interested in evaluating sex differences and marital satisfaction uh, in uh, Hispanic Americans reporting heterosexual relationships. Previous data from predominantly white non-Hispanic samples uh, provides estimates of post-disaster satisfaction among uh, men and women. Okay, so here, uh, looking at some multicultural stuff, impact of cultural uh, things on relationship satisfaction. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to go to again choose a t-test. Here, we're going to go through and choose a difference between two independent. Okay, so we've got our two group, our independent sample uh, test. Uh, again, we're looking at a priori power. Two-tailed test, this defaults to one. Make sure you change that so that it's a two-sample test. Um, effect size, same thing. If you've already calculated your effect size, just put it in there. If you haven't, you can go ahead and hit determine. Mean, mean, standard deviation, standard deviation, calculate, transfer, moves it over. Looks like we actually have a pretty large sample, uh, effect size here, sample, effect size of about one. Um, so what we're doing here is then 0 0.05, 0 0.80, uh, and then my uh, allocation ratio, uh, we're looking at uh, the sort of discrepancy uh, between my two samples. So if my sample is a, so if it was one, that means we've got equal groups across these. Here we've got about a four to one difference between my uh, women and my men, right? So if you notice this, this is from a, a previous example that we had here. So if I take 21 divided by four, that's actually five to one. Twenty-one divided by four is closer to five. That should be five instead of four. So, but this is just to account for that unbalanced design. Remember, because unbalanced designs start to impact our actual power here. So, um, go through, uh, sort of change that. That would be five. But it's not going to make that big of a difference. Um, go through and hit calculate. And again, here it's going to give us group one is going to be ten people. Group two is going to be 38 on sort of this uh, sort of four to one thing. Total sample size 48, actual power 0.81. Okay, so we're going to need some more people here. Questions about the independent sample test? All right, paired sample test, uh, same thing. T test, mean difference between two dependent means. Uh, looking at operator power, two tails. Effect size, again, I, could, I can just hit determine. Here, it might be easier to just hit determine because it's going to do it, all those calculations for you. Mean group one, mean group two, group one, group two, correlation between the group, calculate, transfer. It'll just set things, uh, uh, push things over here. Or if you use the proper uh, formula and you already know it, you can just drop it in there. Um, but again, what you need to make sure is that your estimate of, of, of effect size is accounting for the correlation between your design because that really impacts uh, the power of your test. Alpha 0 0.05, 0 0.80. So here we need 18 people to achieve adequate, adequate power. Questions about this? Okay, cool. So here's my power right up. Effect size 0.45 expected based on existing data from Jones and colleagues. Howard analyses uh, these this data indicated a sample of 32 individuals per group would be required to achieve adequate power. Okay, really quick, really easy, not hard. We're just saying, hey, this is the effect size that I'm expecting based on 
these folks, right? Uh, power analysis tells me that 32 people will be able to achieve adequate power, right? So again, with your power analysis, the big thing is is like letting people know like what you're basing that effect size estimate on. That's critical. Um, that's going to determine sort of what's going on with things. Okay. So some conceptual interpretations. What happens if we go through and we do our due diligence, right? Like I go through, I comb the literature. I go through and I find what I think is going to be a reasonable effect size given the uh, existing literature, the stuff that I've done, the stuff that I'm planning to do. It's a study that looks kind of similar to what I'm planning to do. I go through calculating effects, uh, get, use that uh, effect size estimate to calculate the uh, power for my test. It tells me I need this many people. I go through and I collect that many people, run my tests, and I fail to reject the null hypothesis. Like, how do I go through and make uh, sense of this? Like, well, one, there was an error in my power calculations. I screwed something up somewhere, just made a mistake, and didn't have the number of people I thought I should have, right? I sort of went through and I, on my independent sample test, I, I, I uh, uh, got, a, it said N equals 65. I thought 65 for the whole sample, but that was 65 for a group, and I just collected 65 instead of, or 63 instead of uh, 126, and that's what went right. I just made an error, right? But probably what's more likely is the effect size that I'm looking for is actually smaller than one than what's been previously estimated, right? Why do I say most likely? Why is this most likely? Based on stuff that we've talked about previously. Oh, like we were talking about like effect sizes last time. Sometimes people may be more keen to choose one that just gives you the highest number. Okay. Um, and then also I assume there's some factors of like file drawer effect uh, data maybe that's being collected and has small effect sizes and can published or finding some yeah, yeah, and that's what's going on, right? So if I, if here is my distribution of effect size, and I have a, so I see a D of 0.40, a respectable uh, effect size. Actually, let's not say that. Let's call it 2.5, okay? It's a smallish effect, right? Um, but for any sample, of size n equals 40, right? This is the distribution I can affect that, uh, expect of those effect sizes, right? But if I get something about here with 40 people, I'm not going to identify that as, a, as an effect, right? It's going to come up uh, and I'm going to fail to reject the null. But I can also go through and someone with a sample of 40. They catch something out here that's D equals 0 0.80, right? And again, they didn't do anything. They weren't screwing around. They weren't sort of fooling around with anything. They just happened to have 40 people, and they caught this effect out here, right? And so what they do is they publish this study when everybody else that was over here with 40 people, they didn't because they couldn't publish it because they turned up no results, right? So the only representation in the literature is that this effect, someone found an effect of D equals 0.8. It's a wild overestimation of what the actual population effect is, right? But if that's all we go on, Anna's probably going to go through and power her study and expect a sample of uh, an effect size of 0.8 because that's the only thing we can find. When it's actually 0.25, it's a massive difference in terms of the people that you need, right? I was in a research meeting one time, so I was like, oh, well, uh, you know, this person found this, uh, uh, this uh, found a significant effect and they had a sample of 40, so I'm just going to have 40 people. I should be adequately powered because they were adequately powered to find it and they had 40. But nope, nope, that's not how that works. That person just hit the jackpot. They landed on double zeros and ended up with a wildly inflated effect size. Hopefully not because of anything they did. But then they got to call it, sort of claim an effect and go through and publish it and things like that. But everybody else is way too far down, right? So this is the thing, when you're running our power analysis, like we can fall into this trap of wishful thinking where we want to say like, oh, well, so-and-so, and this is a better study, and so I'm going to sort of use this as my estimate of effect because it's going to mean I need less people, right? Um, but just know that you're probably overestimating the effect that you're looking for, 
and you're probably actually going to need a whole lot more people in order to identify things, right? Now, I'm never going to go through and, like, on the thesis, uh, the thesis or dissertation, like, like, say, oh, no, you can't do that because you didn't run a proper power estimate and things along those lines. I would rather have someone say, hey, here's the effect size. Here's what I can get, right? Um, so probably I'm going to be wildly underpowered, but it's a thesis dissertation, it's not a grant proposal. So if I come up and I'll sort of run that chance, right? I would much rather have someone be explicit and say like, look, this is the way things are, than some magical thinking about like their massive effect size that you're looking for based on functionally nothing, right? So you just gotta be careful and sort of knowing that even if we do our due diligence and uh, grab our best effect, a meta-analysis is gonna be your best bet for identifying effect size, right, as opposed to any individual study. That's going to be an aggregate across stuff and stuff that wasn't published and things along those lines. Um, so that's going to be a better thing. But just know you can set yourself up for some depression and heartbreak. If you do go through all this work and think you're going to hit the jackpot and you come up null anyway, because it could be that sort of the actual effect that you're looking for is quite a bit smaller than what you thought. I guess, like, uh, kind of for that alternative, like, in the, like setting up a study design and trying to estimate power and so without everything we just talked about then would you just be like slightly more conservative with your power estimate or you just or I guess I'm what's the nuance of saying like well I'm guessing this isn't right so I'm just gonna throw 50 more people if it's like reasonable yeah well, like yeah. kind of where's that balance Hold on to that because okay. we're gonna talk about when we talk about uh, some stuff in this next section about okay. something that you could do in theory. It might not always work out, but yeah. Um, so what I might go to do is if I have like, so there's no meta-analysis, but I have maybe three different studies and sort of the effect sizes are different. I'd probably go conservative and go with the smaller of those effect sizes. It's probably going to be the thing that's more reasonable. And if it's not, if the effect size is actually larger, boom, oh, bonus for you. You just won because you've got a, a really nicely powered study. You're going to overshoot your mark, right? Um, so uh, yeah, probably in general, conservative is probably going to be more realistic in terms of these calculations. Um, other thing that can happen is just a victim of type 2 error, right? Like I, I did. I did everything right. I powered my uh, test to 0.8. I have. Uh, but that means if I power to 0.8, I mean 20% of the time I'm going to come up null just because I happen to fall sort of over in this area. Now this is this is not powered 0.8. This is powered like 0.4 probably. But I just happened to I did everything right. So the new fault of my own, I just came up with a, a sample that fell in that 20%. Right? If I go up uh, to uh, uh, the table in, in Las Vegas and I've got a game that's sort of paying 80% of the time, I'm going to spend a lot of time there, but I'm not going to win them all. 20, I'm going to sort of lose relatively frequently, right? So maybe I didn't go in all and put all everything I got in the, the, the first bet, right? But spacing it out over time, I'm going to win, but sometimes 20% I'm going to lose, and you sort of expect the same thing with, uh, with power calculations. <laughs> this is like make you real mad, right? When you go through, you guys just uh, some whiff out on that. But um, yeah, so think about it. now: Are you going to know so which one of these is is what actually happened? Well, if you go back through and check your power calculations, you those back. Ah, I made a mistake. Whoops. But of these two, it's really hard to know, right? So you just have to think carefully about what's going on in the literature. Um, one thing, just want to talk real quick about this. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it. Uh, observed power, like SPSS will do this for you. SPSS will give you your observed power power for a test, right? Um, now, when we're using power calculations appropriately, what we're trying to do is plan for some future study, right? What I've got to do before I do anything, I'm going to say, how many people do I need to adequately power this uh, this project? Um, where we can start to go wrong is where we use our observed power of data that we have to try and develop some sort of situation for why we failed to find the thing that we wanted to find. Okay. Um, and so when we go through, and SPSS will do this, and you can click it, 
what it'll do is it'll give you a calculation of observed power of a test statistic, right? And what it'll do is it'll say, given the sample size that you, or given the effect size that you found in your analyses, it'll tell you, give you a power estimate for um, sort of how much, how powered your test was given sort of the effect size that you found, right? And it'll give you a power estimate of between zero and one, right? And so what we want to do with this observed power is try and infer evidence of plausibility of the null hypothesis um, if I were to fail to reject in a highly powered study, right? So if I go through, the idea is if I go through and I get a study that's really, really highly powered, so I get observed power of 0.9, and I fail to reject in that, then that really means, that probably gives me evidence that the null hypothesis is true, right? Or very close to true. true. If I had a power, a study that's powered 0.9, and I still fail to reject, it's probably null hypothesis. I'm going to say, I'm going to claim, you normally wouldn't do this, but I'm going to claim evidence for the null hypothesis, right? The problem is that this gets into starting into sort of trying to prove the null, which we know is, is problematic, okay? The problem is, is that our observed uh, power is a direct function of our p-value, okay? Um, if I get a p-value that is above 0.05 or something that uh, where I fail to reject, it's always going to cons uh, correspond to low power, okay? There's not a situation, because my observed power is a direct function of my p-value, there's no situation in which I could get a very large p-value, a p-value, I get a p-value 0.5 where it's going to tell me my observed power was really high because they're, they're directly related to one another. So it just can't happen. So this idea of wanting to go through, and so look at my observed power. My observed power is really high, but I still fail to reject, so that means the null hypothesis is true. Can't do that because if my p-value is really high, it's always going to tell me I'm underpowered, always, by definition, mathematically. It will, right? So this thing that we want to have actually, actually can't happen with observed power, right? And so, uh, Honig and Heise, make sure you read this very carefully. It's an excellent article. Make the argument, uh, because observed power is determined completely by my p-value, calculation adds nothing to, like it doesn't tell me anything. It's just a different metric of my, uh, of my p, right? And we refer to this, uh, uh, the authors uh, refer to this as the power approach paradox. What I want to do is I want to go through and take a look at this observed power that tells me something about my study. But it's just redundant information. It doesn't tell me anything, right? Um, probably what's going to happen is I'm going to go through and I'm going to, if I find evidence for my effect, my observed power is probably going to be pretty good. And I can pat myself on the back for having a, a well-powered study, but like this is going to give me a well-powered study, even though it's way off base in terms of stuff, right? Because it's based on the data that I've got, and I have no way of knowing what that actual population value is. It's just going to tell me, okay, yeah, the population value is born white, so you're adequately powered to find it because you found your effect, and so the redundant information it doesn't tell me anything. Or I go through, and the other thing that people will do is they'll go through, like, well, I failed to uh, detect an effect. And if I go through and I look at my observed power, my observed power is low, and so my study was underpowered. Well, it's, it's just circular logic. Like, you have low power because you failed to reject the null. Not, and so maybe your study is underpowered. That's certainly a possibility. Or you just happen to end up down at the bottom end of the distribution, and your study was reasonably powered, you just got a weird sample that took you, you were part of that 20%, right? And so again, uh, one of these things, and you'll see this happen still, people will go through and report their observed power, and they're like, well, I didn't find an effect, but my observed power was low, which means my study was underpowered. It's like, well, it's just telling you that you didn't find an effect. It doesn't actually tell you anything about the power of, of your study. It's, it's, it's redundant information, right? So we can't actually, we can't glean anything useful from observed power, so it's not really a useful thing to go through and then report or look at or, or sort of consider in the most in most cases. All right. Questions on the observed power issue? But again, a really nice article, so make sure you go through and read that.
All right. Going to finish up with some confidence intervals on effect size. Um, if we're thinking about confidence intervals for 